On Monday, Rishi Sunak won the Conservative election by default, after Boris Johnson and Penny Mordaunt pulled out at the last minute. Sunak will become the fourth Conservative Prime Minister in as many years, and he enters office facing the UK's most difficult economic crisis since at least 2008. So in this video, we're going to take a look at how Sunak won the leadership election, how he's going to deal with the turmoil in the markets, and whether he'll be able to unify a Conservative party that can't seem to agree on anything. By the way, if you want to hear our thoughts on Sunak's coronation, then Zach, Jack and I discuss exactly that in the latest episode of our podcast, Trust Issues. The podcast is linked in the description, so you can listen in your favourite podcast app or watch on YouTube. So, before we get into the most recent developments, a quick reminder. On Thursday, after 44 days of political and economic chaos, Liz Truss resigned as Prime Minister, making her the shortest serving Prime Minister in British history. Now, at this point, another leadership election was not expected by many MPs and political commentators because, well, A, the last one ended up with Liz Truss and B, the economic crisis means that the country doesn't really have time for it. However, in the end, the 1922 committee, who basically run the Conservative Party, decided that they would be going for yet another contest. But the threshold for candidacy would be set at 100 MPs rather than just 30 MPs that were needed last time. These 100 Conservative MP backers had to be confirmed by 2pm on Monday to make it onto the ballot paper. Given that there were only about 360 Conservative MPs, this means that at most three candidates could get through. The two obvious candidates here were Rishi Sunak and Penny Mordaunt, who came second and third respectively in the last leadership contest just a couple of months ago. Somewhat predictably, there was also speculation that Boris Johnson, who was at the time on holiday in the Dominican Republic, might throw his hat into the ring. While some MPs were apparently keen for Johnson's return, it was clearly a divisive proposition within the Conservative Party, and even former Johnson loyalists were hesitant. Charles Moore said Boris should sit this one out, and David Frost said it wouldn't be right to repeat the chaos and confusion of the last year. Nonetheless, on Saturday, Johnson flew back from his holiday and held a meeting with his allies to discuss his candidacy. And on Sunday morning, Johnson supporter and Northern Ireland Secretary Chris Heaton-Harris confirmed to Sky News that Johnson would indeed be running, claiming that he already had the support of the required 100 MPs. Now, this claim was met with some scepticism, because by Sunday afternoon, only about 60 MPs had publicly come out in support of Johnson. Anyway, after a few days of intense speculation, on Sunday evening, after holding talks with both Rishi Sunak and Penny Mordaunt, Johnson suddenly announced that he was pulling out of the race. His statement is worth taking a look at, because, well, it's pretty self-assured. In it, Johnson says that he was overwhelmed by the number of people who suggested that he should, once again, contest the Conservative Party leadership, and reminds the reader that he led the party into a massive election victory less than three years ago. Johnson insists that he had the required numbers of nominations and that there was, quote, a very good chance that I would be successful in the election with the Conservative Party members, as well as being well-placed to deliver a Conservative victory in 2024, but says that nonetheless decided to pull out on the basis he wouldn't be able to unify the party. Anyway, most of Johnson's supporters quickly switched over to Sunak, and at about 2pm, Penny Mordaunt admitted she didn't have the numbers, and conceded. This left Rishi Sunak, who at the time had the public support of over half the parliamentary party, to become the leader of the Conservative Party via coronation. I am humbled and honoured to have the support of my parliamentary colleagues, and to be elected as leader of the Conservative and Unionist Party. It is the greatest privilege of my life to be able to serve the party I love and give back to the country I owe so much to. The United Kingdom is a great country, but there is no doubt we face a profound economic challenge. 
Sunak will also become the UK's first ethnic minority prime minister, at least since Disraeli, and the youngest prime minister since the second Earl of Liverpool in 1812. So what will Sunak do now he's in office? Well, the first thing in his intray will be calming the markets, probably via balancing the budget. Luckily for both Sunak and, well, anyone in the UK who doesn't want a sovereign default, the markets have already responded positively to Sunak's appointment. The yield on 10-year gilt is already down 30 basis points, from a high of 4.1% on Friday to about 3.8% as of 2pm Monday. This is good news for Sunak. Not only does it mean that the markets will probably respond well to his budget when it happens, but the fact that yields are already down means that Sunak actually already has more fiscal space than Truss and Quarteng did. Simon French, an economist at Panmuir Gordon, who also writes a column in The Times, estimates that the fall in gilt yields that's happened just because markets trust Sunak more than Truss will save the Treasury about £7 billion per year. Nonetheless, even with that extra £7 billion, Sunak is still left with a fiscal black hole of about £30 billion, and balancing the books will require painful cuts. We'll have to wait for his first budget to find out what those cuts will actually involve, but some possible contenders include raising taxes, cutting defence spending, or scrapping the pensions triple lock. Whatever it is, it's unlikely to be popular with either the general public or the Conservative Parliamentary Party. And Tunak will likely struggle to keep the party together, especially if their poll numbers don't improve. While Sunak has the explicit support of a majority of MPs, there have been some outspoken exceptions, including Nadine Dorries and Christopher Chope, who have both called for a general election. If Sunak's policies are too divisive, or if the poll numbers don't improve significantly, then we should expect to see more Conservative infighting. As things stand, hypothetical polling done over the weekend by JL Partners polls suggests that Sunak is 11 points behind Labour, although Retfield Wilton polling found he was 20 points behind. While it's still better than Truss, it's still a pretty significant deficit, and Sunak will probably need to close the gap if he wants to maintain party unity. If that's not enough Sunak chat, then be sure to check out the latest episode of our podcast, where Zach, Jack and I discuss what happened over the weekend, and if we think Sunak's coronation hurts Labour's chance of winning in 2024. You can watch the podcast on YouTube, or if you prefer to listen, just search for Trust Issues in your favourite podcast app. And search right now, as we're going to need a new title pretty soon.